Hi, my name is Olivia Lanes, and I'm giving the next lecture in the Kiskate Global Summer School. Today's lesson is going to be on quantum computing hardware and superconducting circuits. So to outline what we are going to cover today, we are going to talk about what a real qubit is for probably the first time um, in the two-week series of lectures. Now, then we're going to talk about atoms and artificial atoms, also known as superconducting qubits. And we're going to talk about why they are sometimes called artificial atoms. We will then go into the DiVincenzo criteria, which is the criteria that was set forth that we have to have in order to say we have built a universal quantum computer. We are then going to talk a little bit about classical circuits so that we can compare and contrast their components to the quantum circuits that we're going to be building, and the Josephson junction as the most crucial element of those circuits. And then lastly, we're going to talk about how to control and measure a transmon qubit, which is the type of qubit that IBM builds all of its quantum hardware from. So the motivation of today's lecture is basically to understand what is in the golden chandelier. This is the cryostat, the dilution refrigerator, that houses basically all of the cryogenic components, all of the quantum components, the cables, the amplifiers, everything that we actually need in order to read out the quantum computer at cryogenic temperatures, not including the room temperature controls, and the quantum processor itself. Um, like I said, this is a cryogenic machine. It's made up of many different stages, so you can see the different stages, the different levels, where all of the wires are connecting each, each plate, each different level to one another, and it's gradually getting colder. At the top, it starts out at room temperature, and then at the bottom, it hits temperatures of about 15 millikelvin, which is colder than outer space. It's insanely cold. And we do this through a mixture of a combination of helium-3 and helium-4. And like I said, all this quantum stuff is kept at insanely cold temperatures all the way at the bottom here in the canister, which you can't see in this picture um, because it's all canned up for experimentation purposes. And we're going to go into what's in it and how to build up these devices. So now let's talk about the DiVincenzo criteria. As I mentioned, this, is, this was coming earlier. So the DiVincenzo criteria is basically the accepted criteria that was set forth by David DiVincenzo. And it's basically a checklist. So in order to say you have built a universal quantum computer, you need to have all of the following. You need to have a well-behaved quantum system. Here I'm showing a quantum system as this cartoonish block sphere, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, people have probably mentioned it in previous lectures, but the block sphere basically is a, um, it's a 3D sphere where the excited state and the ground state of the qubit are at the poles of the sphere and the maximally entangled states rest along the equator of the sphere. But the qubit can be in any state along the surface of the sphere as well. We need to be able to initialize our qubits into well-known states. Basically, we need to be able to put them in the ground state or put them in the excited state or any other well-known defined state in order to run specific algorithms. We also need to have relatively long coherence times. So quantum systems don't like to stay in quantum states forever. In fact, they only stay in these states for a very precious short amount of time, generally. And we need to make sure that before they spontaneously decohere or lose their quantum state and you know, devolve back into the ground state, that we can run our algorithms and run our quantum circuits. So these circuits have to be done in a short amount of time compared to the coherence time, the stability of the qubit. We also need a universal set of quantum gates, and these are operations that you can apply to your qubit. In this lecture, we're going to be talking how to do that through a series of microwave pulses, and these need to be able to be built up in order to create any sort of operation of this vector pointing along the block sphere that you might want to do. And lastly, we also need qubit-specific measurement capability. And what that means is we need to be able to individually measure every single qubit in our quantum processor without interfering with the other qubits. So once you have all of these criteria, you can say, yes, we have achieved the DiVincenzo checklist and we have built a universal quantum computer. But what is a real qubit anyway? You probably have not seen one before, and we're going to continue to talk a little bit more about this cartoonish picture of this block sphere, which I'm sure you're familiar with at this point. But this is really a toy model that's describing a qubit. A qubit is not a sphere. It doesn't actually look like this funny ball thing at all. 
but it's an incredibly useful model because you can see how the vector that points from the origin of the sphere to anywhere on the surface of the sphere can keep track of the energy state of the qubit. So one thing you'll notice here is that I've plotted the energy levels of the qubit in different colors here on the right. And the qubit only generally represents the ground state and the excited state. And it pretty much ignores any higher energy levels that actually do exist in real life systems, which is why this is just a model, it's just a cartoon image. This is not what an actual qubit looks like and it's not how an actual qubit even really functions. So here are some examples of what real qubits look like. This is an ion trap, a superconducting processor, this is an NV center qubit, um, and these are silicon dot qubits. You can make qubits out of many different actual physical architectures. You basically just need what DiVincenzo said, a stable two-level system. But we're going to be focusing today on the superconducting qubit architecture because this is the one that IBM uses. But I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows there are actually many different types. So toy model on the left, that's not reality. It's just a description that we use to visualize what's going on. Real life on the right, that's what these things actually look like. We're going to take a closer look later on. So like I said, there are many different flavors of qubits, right? And these are some of the ones that I showed on the, on the previous slide. But like I said, this lecture is only going to focus on the superconducting loops, the superconducting circuits for now. But just as a fun fact, Qiskit can actually be used for other companies' hardware as well and different types of architectures. All right, so unfortunately, the whole history of quantum mechanics and quantum physics is a little bit out of scope for this lesson. But I think part of the relevant story here is the discovery of quantized energy spectra. So this was first discovered um, from this sort of toy uh, experiment that you can see here. So for instance, if we have this excited hydrogen sample and we direct the light that comes from the hydrogen sample <clears throat> through a slit and then through a prism, what comes out on the other side of the prism when you look at it through a detector is only a few uh, specific colors of different wavelengths. And this is sort of curious because normally when you shine light through a prism, you sort of famously get a rainbow. But here we only get a few specific colors. And it turns out when people looked at other elements using the same sort of setup, they got sort of similar results. Helium had a few more lines, neon had a few more lines on top of that, but it was always the same exact colors and the same exact lines. And this is because if you were to look at the emission of photons coming from these atoms, they come from very specific quantized energy levels within the system. So a photon that would fall and be de-excited from the first excited state to the ground state would have a very specific energy associated with it. The difference between the energy at zero and the energy at one, which relates to a very specific frequency, a very specific color. And similarly, two, three, four, as you far go up further and further, it all works exactly the same. And all of these levels are quantized. So there's no level that it can exist at in between zero and one or in between one and two. And that's why all of the wavelengths are always the same color. And this led Bohr and his colleagues to say, you know, energy is quantized. And that's how we started to uh, develop quantum mechanics as a useful theory. Now we could go ahead and just use one of these atoms as a qubit. Because if you look at the potential energy landscape of an atom, it goes about one over R, where R is the radius of the electron from the nucleus, from the center of the atom. And of course these energy levels are quantized, so you could just use those bottom two rungs here that you see in blue and red that I've labeled as the qubit. And that's because this energy potential is what we call anharmonic. It means all of the energy levels are not equally spaced. So for instance, if a laser is shown on the atom of interest and we had an electron in the ground state and the laser had an energy that was at that difference of the spacing between zero and one, it would drive a transition of that atom from the ground state to the first excited state. So as you can see in this picture, only a laser with that energy difference would affect our qubit. And that's why you can use these, um, these atoms and these potentials as qubits, because even if they have 
higher order energies, they're not at the same spacing. So you can pretty much ignore them for you know, first order calculations. So if atoms are nature's perfect qubit, why are we making circuits at all? Um, we, we make circuits that essentially mimic atoms. Like we said, we call them pseudo-atoms or artificial atoms. And we do this because we would like to be able to engineer all components of that atom. We want to make everything a knob. We want to make that potential a knob. We want to make that spacing a knob. We want to make the spacing to the other higher order energy states, which we don't want the qubit to accidentally leak into, um, something that we can control. And in addition, we want to be able to leverage the semiconductor fabrication industry, which is already a huge industry. It's what develops all of the chips that we use in our normal computers on a day-to-day -day basis. So the infrastructure in order to create superconducting circuits is already there. So essentially, this gives us much more control than if we were to just, you know, steal some atoms from nature. All right, now we are going to move on to classical electrical circuit components. So this is just a little bit of background information here. And I'm sorry to advanced students who might find this a little repetitive or a little introductory, but it's always better to be refreshed on a topic than to be confused later on, I think. And so this will bring us all back to the same page. So the toolkit that you have for creating classical electrical circuits is first the resistor, which is symbolized by this jagged uh, squiggly line here. And this implements electrical resistance in your circuit. So basically, you can think of it as like if you had a pipe with flowing water, resistance is what it sounds like. If you introduce some sort of blockage or sludge into the pipe and it keeps the water from, sl from going through the pipe really fast, it slows it down, that's what resistance does. A capacitor, symbolized by these two parallel lines here, stores energy in the electric field. And the inductor, stores energy in a magnetic field, and that's symbolized by these loopy curves here. So all three of these together represent the components that we have to build up our circuits with. Capacitors store charge, and inductors will store this energy in a magnetic field, and together they all work uh, with one another and can all be described by Kirchhoff's laws, which are pretty simple to understand if you're interested. I, I uh, encourage you to just Wikipedia it very quickly, but it basically just described how all of the energy and the circuits are always conserved. And similarly, flux and charge are going to be continuous variables in these circuits as well. But what is flux and charge? Well, flux is defined as the rate of flow of a property per unit area, which has the dimensions of quantity over time over area. And so basically, this is equal to the magnetic field times the cross-section of that area, where the magnetic field is symbolized by B here, A is the area, and then theta would be the perpendicular vector from that area to the magnetic field. Charge is the basic physical property of matter that causes it to experience a force when kept in an electric or a magnetic field. An electric charge is associated with an electric field, and the moving electric charge can generate a magnetic field. And that's symbolized here by the integral over time of that charge. So if you combine both of these properties together, what you would see would yield an LC circuit, an inductor and a capacitive circuit. And this turns out to be a very important circuit for us going forward. And the Hamiltonian, which is the total energy contributions from this circuit, is equal to this, where you can see that the charge Q is squared and plays a large component and the flux does as well. And we can also write down the characteristic frequency of this circuit, which is equal to 1 over 2 pi root LC. Now we're going to look at linear circuits first because I think it's really most simple to build off of a circuit that we're most familiar with. So this is a circuit that I made in graduate school um, that I nano fabricated here. It's actually almost microscopic. You almost can't really see it with your naked eye. Um, but this is the most simple circuit that I can think of to start with. It's a resonator. So I want you to see in red here, I've highlighted these interdigitated finger capacitors that are sort of interleaved with one another. But this is just um, a good way of building up a lot of capacitance in a small amount of area. So this serves as our capacitor in our schematic over here on the right. And then these loopy things here that are attached to it, 
represent the inductor. So there's no resistance in this resonator, it's just capacitance and the inductance. And if you look at the Hamiltonian, which is the same as on the previous slide, you can see we have the charge, we have the flux, but I want you to compare this to a Hamiltonian that you may or may not be more familiar with, which is the Hamiltonian of a classical harmonic oscillator. And you can really see here that it's almost the exact same equation. And if you look at the kinetic energy component, it mimics the exact same kinetic energy component of this classical Hamiltonian. And similarly, the potential energy component from the flux mimics the potential energy of the component of the Hamiltonian on the bottom. So it's really the exact same energy. And this leads to some pretty interesting math. So if you were to look at the potential well that we created here. It's the exact same as a harmonic oscillator. So if you want to make this oscillator and this Hamiltonian now quantum, fun fact, all you have to do is put a little hat on all your variables uh, in theory because we're physicists and, and we're lazy and so that's all we know to do. Um, and now you're working with a quantum harmonic oscillator or a quantum LC circuit. And if we, we already know these terms here, but one, one thing I wanted to point out is that you can rewrite this Hamiltonian actually in terms of something called the number operator. And the number operator symbolizes what energy state the Hamiltonian is in. Um, if you're not familiar with that, if you haven't taken quantum mechanics yet, no worries, it doesn't really matter. You just can focus on the visual aspect of it for now. So for an oscillator, you can see we have this potential well with all these different energy levels where every rung is just equally spaced from one another, like a ladder, right? And the energy separation in between every single one of these rungs is the same. It's equal to h bar omega naught, where omega naught is that classical resonance from our circuit. And the n here, the n hat, would represent zero, one, two, three, as we climb up the ladder. So you can see that the spacing is really just h bar omega over two for every single one of these, because it's a linear separation. Um, but this doesn't really make for a good qubit uh, because if you remember from you know a few slides ago, if we wanted to use a laser or an electric pulse or a microwave pulse to isolate two rungs of this ladder, we couldn't do that because the energy separation between every single rung and the next rung is exactly the same. So we need to introduce a unique way to make this a qubit. And now I'm going to do... Um, a little bit of a step sideways here uh, and go on a bit of a tangent on superconductivity since this is so crucial for our superconducting qubits. And I don't think it's really covered very much or particularly well at all in undergraduate classes. But the basic idea behind superconductivity is that at a specific temperature for some metals only, their intrinsic resistance vanishes. So if you look at this graph on the right here, you can see that the resistance for a non-superconducting metal as the temperature is really, really lowered to almost absolute zero, it sort of bottoms out, but it always has some intrinsic resistance to it. A superconductor, on the other hand, at some temperature, completely bottoms out, and the resistance goes to absolute zero. So even if you were to design an optimal LC circuit, for instance, out of a normal metal, it would actually still have some native resistance to it, even if it's really, really small. So a lot of times when people draw these LC circuits, they introduce another little resonator in parallel with the circuit. Even if they don't actually put a resistor in the circuit, it's just intrinsic to the properties of that metal. But this is bad because resistors create dissipation and heat energy that is lost. We have to get rid of this. And the way that we do that is not by working with normal metals, but only with superconductors in our circuit. If you're interested in the math and physics, uh, theory behind what I'm about to say, I, I again refer you to the Wikipedia page on superconductivity or BCS theory, um, which I'm going to cite at the end of this lecture. But all you really need to know for now is that at very cold temperatures, the electrons sort of pair up because of an attractive interaction due to the atomic lattice and the spacing in the metal. And when we call, we call these electron pairs when they, when they pair up and they get stuck to one another, Cooper pairs. And another important effect to know when this happens is that they, they uh, display the Meissner effect. And the Meissner effect says 
and you can see visually here that no magnetic field can penetrate superconductors. So in a normal metal or at a temperature above the critical temperature where the resistance goes to zero, magnetic fields can simply pass through a superconductor or a metal, but it totally repels it when the temperature is below that critical temperature and magnetic fields cannot penetrate it at all. And this leads to really cool effects like you can see here, something that we would call magnetic levitation, just as sort of an aside. All right, so now we're gonna introduce probably the, the bread and butter, I would say, of superconducting circuits, which is the Josephson Junction. So the Josephson Junction, pictured here, you know, in a cartoon version on the left, is a layer in yellow of superconductor, and then there's an insulating barrier, and then there's another layer of superconductor. So it's a superconducting sandwich. It looks a little bit like a parallel plate capacitor. And in a circuit diagram, you would symbolize it with a, a box with a cross through it. And the important equations to know from a Josephson junction is the uh, current relationship, which says that the current is equal to the critical current times sine phi, where phi is the phase across that insulating barrier. And then the energy is equal to the Josephson energy and the cosine of that phase. And then you can see here on the right a couple examples of pictures that I took in graduate school of actual Josephson junctions. So you can see what they would look like under a really powerful microscope. And you can also see what, that they come in many different shapes and sizes. <clears throat> so the first at the top um, you can see is a transmon qubit. So you can si sort of see that like big flat piece on the top and then that tiny little finger that's resting on top of it. And you can't see it, but in between there, there is some insulation and only that overlapping region is where the Josephson junction is. And similarly, I've highlighted the overlapping region and you're looking you know, top down so you can't see the cross section of an amplifier Josephson junction. This is a cryogenic amplifier. We're gonna talk a little bit more about those later. But as you can see in the first one, the width is only about you know, 90 to 100 nanometers, but we can make them much larger in general. So again, this is one of the knobs that we have to turn and one of the benefits of working with pseudo atoms is we can control the size of the Josephson junction, which really affects all of the properties of the superconducting circuit. So now if we were to look at a cross section of what a Josephson junction looks like, you can see that here in black and white, you can really see the ordered lattice of here, they're using aluminum as their superconductor. And then in the middle, aluminum oxide was allowed to sort of grow naturally. Aluminum oxide grows very quickly on top of aluminum and it becomes sort of scattered and disordered and messy. And then on the other side, it again becomes a lattice. And this is what a Josephson junction looks like. Um, on the top here, I drew a little bit of math for you. The superconducting order parameter is also sort of known as the wave function, which represents the Cooper pairs in the metal and the Cooper pairs actually tunnel across the insulating barrier to the other side. And this nonlinear, this nonlinearity is what's responsible for all of the really interesting properties of a superconducting circuit with Josephson junctions. Linear properties only lead to linear results, like the latter in terms of the potential energy of the harmonic oscillator. And that type of linear system is boring and we can't use it. So nonlinearity is really the, the magic and the key in order to do anything interesting in, in physics. And then on the right here, I'm showing you a sketch of a current voltage relationship from a superconducting junction. The Cooper pair tunneling current is seen where the uh, voltage goes to zero. And then over at the sides, you can see it introduces some resistance again um, as a function of the, uh, that delta there, which is an energy gap. In solid state physics, this energy gap is an energy range where no electron states exist. And that's essentially where the, the density of states would vanish. This is known as the ambogoakar barakov relationship. And it's really important because it allows us to calculate things like the critical current in terms of just measuring the resistance of that metal at room temperature, because it would be you know, really, really hard to measure it once it was already in the bottom of the fridge and it becomes insanely cold. All right, so now a little bit of math. We already talked about the Hamiltonian of a linear LC circuit, but now you'll recall me saying that linear relationships are boring and we can't really do anything with them. So we need to get rid of that linear term, which is why I cross it off from the inductor and replace it with the term for the Josephson energy that I showed you on the previous slide. So if we get rid of that term, 
because we're no longer using a linear inductance, we are now using a nonlinear inductance, we have this description here. And we need to play with it a little bit. So what we're going to do is a Taylor expansion of this cosine term. And a Taylor expansion is basically an abbreviation of a function that goes on forever. But you can cut it off after you know a few terms in order to have a mathematical description that you can solve. Of course, it's not quite as mathematically accurate as using the cosine, but it actually allows us to do something with the function. So we do this Taylor expansion from this cosine term here, and then we start grouping terms together that we recognize. And so you can make a few substitutions here, plug in L for this phi naught over 2, and then you can see here what we actually end up getting in the end is a harmonic oscillator with a higher order perturbation term on top of it. And we can write this, if you're interested, in terms of ladder operators. They're called, known as A and A dagger. And this is the operator which essentially is responsible for changing the circuit from one energy level to the other and then back again. So you can see here, if we again make some more proper substitutions, we can write this Hamiltonian in terms of H bar omega A dagger A plus a little bit of other extra terms on top of it. So what this essentially means, and what I want you to picture visually, is a typical harmonic oscillator, but with a little bit of extra nonlinear stuff on top of it. And this is the approximate Hamiltonian for a Joseph's injunction. And for more details on this derivation, if you're interested, um, I encourage you to see Zlatko Menev's lecture from the first global summer school. So like I said, what you're going to picture now is almost a harmonic oscillator. But now what you can see is that we've actually, by introducing a nonlinear term, stretched it. So now you can see that these arrows representing the rungs and the energy spacing of the ladder are no longer equally spaced. They are no longer equidistant. And what we actually do in reality is we shunt this LC circuit with even more capacitance. And this allows us to control how big that spacing is. And the capacitor actually shrinks the anharmonicity, which is that separation, and makes it insensitive to charge noise. So charge noise are these fluctuating charges in the, in the metal, and this results in a fluctuating electric field, and that's bad. So we need to make it insensitive to that type of noise. And then you can see here, finally, if we were to drive a transition at that purple energy difference, that purple arrow there between the G, the ground, and the excited state, you would be able to have a qubit and you wouldn't excite transitions, at least theoretically, to any other energy state because those energy differences are separated by at least 200 megahertz. So now let's take a look at um, an IBM transmon qubit specifically. A transmon is a type of superconducting uh, qubit. All right, so if you zoom in here a little bit, you can see that these parallel plate capacitors are that big extra capacitance that I talked about, which can control the anharmonicity. And it's really hard to see here. You have to zoom in even more. But finally, you can see the Joseph's injunction. And you can see here the two little fingers of the metals overlapping. And that is exactly where the junction is. And you can't see this with the naked eye at all. You have to use an SEM microscope. Um, one thing we didn't talk about yet, and that you'll see here in the diagram, is that all of these qubits are coupled to these squiggly lines on the top and bottom. And those are superconducting microwave resonators. And we're going to talk about those a little bit later on. But basically, these are responsible for the readout of the qubit and um, multiple qubit quantum buses. And also, they can be used to create filters at the qubit frequency as well. So now let's just take a little, a little step back um, before our break. So if we were to look at the dilution or fridge again, the qubits themselves and the Joseph's injunctions are probably the most important concept and component of the hardware course. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff in the fridge that we haven't talked about yet at all, right? And you can see that in, in this picture on the golden chandelier. Um, and you can see underneath all of these vacuum shields, the input and the output cables, which take the signal up from the qubits and then back to the qubits and through all those different temperature levels. There's really a whole lot going on here within the cans. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that after our break.
All right, so now we're going to be talking a little bit about something called non-demolition measurement. And I'm going to be talking about a classical example of non-demolition measurement first, because I think it's a little bit easier to understand before we move on to a quantum example of non-demolition measurement. So let's talk about what that is. Um, one of the fun challenges about quantum measurement is that quantum stuff needs to be isolated from the environment in order to do quantum things. Observation or leaks of information into the environment prevent that. But we have to be able to extract some information, of course, right? If we can't interact with it at all, then what good is it? So we introduce this topic of non-demolition, which is sort of exactly what it sounds like. It means the act of extracting the information changes and in some cases destroys the state that you're trying to observe. So an example of this um, comes from the very wise Howard Wiseman. Um, and you want to picture a canister of hydrogen gas. So you have this big canister of hydrogen gas. And my task to you is to decide, is there any way to know if there is gas left in the container or if it's empty? And you can't just open it and look, right? Because hydrogen is invisible and it would just, you know, disperse into the air. So instead, and this is a very bad idea, you know, don't do this, um, but you take a match and you hold it near the spout of the handle. And when you open it, it could combust and explode into a fiery mess. Um, if that happens, then you know there was hydrogen in the can because hydrogen is very flammable. Um, and this is obviously an example of demolition measurement uh, because you blow it up and you destroyed it. Um, but this is, again, a classical example, not quantum. So this was obviously not an intelligent way to do this measurement. So why don't we all you know, take a second here and try to think about how we might do this in a more intelligent way, in a way that would not destroy the canister or light it on fire. And as a hint, this is very similar to an experiment that I talked about, you know, way back on like the second or third slide. So if instead we take our canister and we shine a laser and direct a laser across this sort of spout at the top, and then look at the absorption lines, if we're able to direct that into a detector, and you could see if the hydrogen is still in the canister, the direct lines of absorption where those wavelengths would be absorbed from the laser in the hydrogen. And then you would know, without destroying it, that there is, in fact, hydrogen inside the container still. So this is obviously a much more intelligent way of measuring the experiment. All right, so now let's look at a example of quantum demolition versus non-demolition. Let's say we have our superconducting circuit, our qubit, here drawn in this schematic format, highlighted in blue. And it's hooked up to a transmission line. So that would be like those input cables that I showed you before the break that go down into the fridge. They have those little loops on them. Um, and this would be direct observation of the qubit. And that's bad because even if we are not trying to measure the qubit, light and signals can still leak into the qubit and from the qubit into the transmission line. And this can ruin the quantum state of the qubit. And all of this information can just leave at any time. So that's bad. So this is not going to work for us. Instead, let's couple the qubit to a cavity resonator. And this is actually much more suitable for Q&D or quantum non-demolition measurement because, and this is important, the frequencies of the qubit and the cavity resonator are very different one another. So they don't just intrinsically talk to one another, even though you can see here that they're coupled to one another through that um, capacitance, those parallel plate capacitors in the schematic format that I drew on the top. So they don't just talk to one another and leak information to one another because they're not at the same frequency. They're not at the right frequency. So if information goes from the transmission line into the cavity, we can extract information from the cavity and it goes back to us, but we don't directly interfere with the qubit. So this is Q and D. In order to perform measurement on the qubit, we never interact with it directly. Instead, we do something called quantum dispersive measurement. And so we couple that cabinet like I showed you in a previous slide and like you saw when we actually looked at the transmon chip to a 2D or a 3D cavity. We're using 2D cavities here, but sometimes you can take the whole qubit and actually put it into like a physical cylinder, a physical capaci uh, resonator, but it works the exact same. The, the math is the same. So what this actually looks like in Hamiltonian format is this here. 
And you can see that in terms of the raising and lowering operators, the qubit is in purple, the cavity is in green, the cavity is um, an anharmonic oscillator, sorry, the cavity is a harmonic oscillator, the qubit is an anharmonic oscillator, and then the last term would be their interaction term, which is how they speak to one another. So in the dispersive regime, like I said, the qubit and cavity are very far off in frequency. And what this actually means is that if we were to ask the resonator, if we were to send a pulse of microwave light down through those cables into the resonator, we could measure the frequency of the resonator, and that frequency will actually shift a little bit down or a little bit up, depending on what the state of the qubit is. So we never actually directly talk to the qubit, we talk to the resonator, and the resonator's frequency is affected by the qubit. And so you can see that either here in magnitude or in phase, here we're looking at a schematic of the readout amplitude in terms of I and Q, and if you've never heard of those before, it's basically just components of a microwave signal or any signal really. And it basically just means the imaginary and the real component of that signal. And so if you um, square them and add them together, the root of that would be equal to the magnitude of that amplitude. And then similarly, with the inverse tangent of those components, you can understand the phase of that signal as well. And like I said, the phase and the magnitude will shift to the left or the right, depending on if the qubit is excited or in the ground state. And what we actually see on our computer when we plot the I and Q component is a little Gaussian blob, basically a little fuzzy circle that appears on one side or the other side, depending on if that qubit is in G or E. And the square root of n here um, just basically means how many photons are in our measurement signal. And phi is the phase that separates them. So now let's examine how we actually read out one of these qubits at room temperature, because the qubit in the cavity system actually lives in the bottom of the dilution refrigerator, right? And we saw that. And it's very far removed from room temperature for us to be able to see or interact with it, given that we're at room temperature, we're not at 15 millikelvin, right? And we're not in a cryogenic vacuum container. And those solution refrigerators have four cans stacked on top of one another, so you can't see or touch it or interact with it whatsoever. So what we actually do is we send a microwave, a coherent microwave pulse, represented here by this gray blob, and it's centered at I and Q now because it hasn't interacted with the qubit, it hasn't shifted yet down into the fridge. The fridge is marked here schematically by that um, blue box. And then it will interact with the qubit. It'll figure out through the resonator if it's in the G or the E state. And then it will shift in phase a little bit when it leaves the, the resonator and the dilution refrigerator. And I've marked that here in either a red or blue phase shift, where the phase shift is described by that theta here. However, this isn't actually what you see at room temperature in the setup that I've drawn for you here. You don't actually see the G or the E blob move because that phase shift is so small. So in order to see the diagram that I plotted for you here, we actually have to introduce something called cryogenic amplifiers. So now let's look at a first type of amplifier, which is called the Hempt amplifier. This is a high electron mobility transistor amplifier, and it adds a lot of gain or amplification to the readout chain. But as I've drawn for you here, it also adds a great deal of noise, of thermal noise. So if we just send one pulse down into the dilution refrigerator, we call this a single shot measurement. You can see that it basically adds so much noise that yes, it makes the blobs bigger and you can see them sort of shift from one side to the other, but there's so much overlapping region due to that noise that if the qubit fell somewhere, or if the measurement fell somewhere in between those two Gaussian blobs, you wouldn't really have any good way of knowing what state the qubit was in. And this is bad because in order to do error correction or run algorithms, we need single shot measurement capability. And that's not always possible with just a hemp amplifier. You would need to do a lot of averaging in order to create good separation between those two distributions. So we add a very special component to the readout chain, something called a quantum limited amplifier, which is not actually normally talked about in hardware lectures much at all, but I think it's very important. And it's also what I did my PhD in, and this is my lecture, uh, so we can talk about it. Um, so basically you add this amplifier before the hemp. You call it a pre-amplifier. So we amplify the signal a little bit. And what is 
so fascinating about these amplifiers is that they add only the minimum amount of allowable noise as dictated by quantum mechanics to the readout. So if you're familiar at all with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that says you can't make a precise measurement of, of momentum and of uh, 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 distance at the exact same time. There's some element of noise in between these measurements. And it works exactly the same with the amplifier. Only the things you can't measure simultaneously are the I and Q component of the measurement. There's some uncertainty that just has to be there. And quantum mechanics tells us that on average, that noise is equal to half a photon. But this is still good enough. And this green outline here, I'm using to represent those quantum fluctuations. Because when you amplify the signal even more, still using that same Hempt amplifier now, you can see that we are not overwhelmed with, with the noise, with the thermal noise. It's not saturated. Yes, it has gone a little bit beyond that threshold, and I have divided out the gain here just so you can see the signal to noise ratio at the bottom. But you can see that even if there is some degradation of the SNR, we still have two totally well separated distributions at room temperature now. And you can tell the state of the qubit from a single measurement. So if that gray pulse goes in and it comes out and it lands you know, on the left here in that area of that blue bob, you know just from one measurement that that qubit was in the ground state. If it lands on the right side, somewhere within that red blob, you know that the qubit was in the excited state. And this allows us to do all sorts of really cool things, like state preparation, um, measurement backend experiments, error correction. I could go on. And if you're interested in learning more about pam parametric amplifiers, um, I suppose I would direct you to my thesis. Um, but this is just an example of what those amplifiers enable. We spoke about how single shot measurement is really important as a component of quantum computing, right? And this graph is something called um, uh, quantum jumps, which is not a new ability. As you can see, it was done in 2011 here. And I measured them a bunch in graduate school, but it's still, it's really, really cool. And you, here you can see the qubit evolving in real time. There's no averaging happening here. And it switches between the ground state and the excited state. And this is all due to the fact that the Josephson junction is such an interesting and critical component of these circuits because all of the amplifiers, all these cryogenic amplifiers, are also just made out of those same components as well, just larger ones like I showed you in that picture. And like I said, if you want to know more, um, there's plenty of, of, of sources available to learn more about amplifiers. So now let's um, take another step forward and learn a little bit more of uh, quantum gates. So let's learn, start from a theoretical perspective. And hopefully you're already all familiar with Pauli matrices. And maybe you already know as well that combining these matrices can basically create any, any rotation about the block sphere that you would possibly want. And so by combining them, for instance, here you can see if we want to do an X rotation of angle theta about the block sphere and have our qubit orient itself from the top to the equator or vice versa, we would simply be able to do that using um, some amount, some component of the, of the X pulse here, a pi over two rotation. Um, and there's a lot of examples of classical gates as well. So classical computers, um, this is a truth table, are, are, are built using classical gates. These are just some examples of the ANAND and NOR gate. And similarly, quantum computers use quantum gates. So you can see here that those truth tables look a little bit different. Um, you can see that the C naught gate basically is, uh, it, well, it's used as an entangling gate when the input is in a superposition state. But if you just look at the input, if both are 0, 0, then the output is 0, 0. If the two input components of the qubits are 0, 1, the output is 0, 1. And then it only changes if the, uh, uh, if the second qubit component is in 1. And the C phase gate will introduce a phase if the second qubit is measured to be in one, and the swap will introduce a, a phase as well. So you can make all sorts of different gates, but basically using a combination of the single qubit rotations and these two qubit gates here, you can form a universal gate set, which means I can create any type of rotation and any type of interaction that I could possibly want to write any sort of algorithm from some combination of these gates that I've shown you.
But how do we actually apply these gates and how do we actually interact with the superconducting qubits? So this schematic here represents the inside of the fridge again, where every single layer um, is getting colder towards the bottom where the processor is. And a microwave generator or more room temperature control electronics create these microwave pulses that are calibrated very precisely with frequency and amplitude and phase in order to create those rotations about the block sphere. And these pulses then travel down the transmission lines and the line of the fridge you can see here with all those loops on it. And on many different levels, it goes through uh, attenuators. And these attenuators reduce the power of the signal but don't disrupt the waveform or the shape of the signal. And it just prevents too much power from reaching the qubits and they don't like it when that happens. So in order to create these shaped pulses, we also need something called an arbitrary waveform generator, which is also called an AWG. And basically this allows you to program a very specific shape of pulse. And then when you combine that in something called a, a mixer with a microwave generator, which will tell you the frequency and the amplitude, then you're allowed to create a very specific shape of pulse, which has the exact shape that you define with the AWG, and then all of the other components, such as the frequency that you combine with the microwave generator, and then you can send that to your qubit. And if you look at this Hamiltonian above here, um, this is the term on the bottom here that we're generating by applying that oscillating voltage to the qubit. And then what we actually do is, like you said, it goes, or like I said, it goes through all those cables with those loops down through the fridge. And then it goes into the bond pad here, which is on the bus resonator from the qubit through the resonator. And then it would interact with the resonator and we would be able to read out the qubit that way. Um, and just as a quick side note, programming all of these pulses, um, it's not trivial. It's not the hardest thing, but this is why it's so important to have a very strong coding background. And when people talk about you know, needing to have a strong CS background and understand how to program um, you know, in Python or in other languages, even if as an experimentalist like me, this is why. This is what I'm talking about. Because you need to know how to program all of these room temperature control electronics in order to accurately send and read out these signals. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so one more really quick look at the single qubit control. So if we were to define our pulse with that really um, specific and calibrated frequency and it would go into our resonator, we could basically create any type of single qubit rotation that we want. And those rotations come for free if you just shift the phase of the subsequent pulses. So it doesn't matter what the global phase that you defined is, as long as the relative phase between the first pulse you send and those following pulses are all exactly what you want them to be. That's how we create single qubit rotations about different axes. And two qubit gates, um, most famously, is probably the CNOT gate and the way we enact the CNOT gate is through something called the cross resonance gate, which is also known as a ZX operation. And basically the way you do this is by shooting one of those microwave pulses with that really specific shape like we defined on the previous slide to one qubit at a coupled qubit's frequency. So if you have two qubits and they're able to interact with one another through um, some sort of coupling, a capacitance, in order to make them entangled with one another, you shoot the signal at one qubit at the other qubit's frequency. Just, I want to be clear on that. And then you can see what would happen to the block sphere here is it sort of rotates one way and the other way at the same time. And that's how we would create entanglement here. And you can see that um, through a, a real picture here of the target and the control qubit and how they would interact with each other in the middle here through one of those um, loopy things again those um, bus resonators where the J represents the strength of the coupling in between those two different qubits. And we can scale up these exact same components and control and abilities that I've been talking about to really, really large processors at this point. I mean, I didn't show you any in-depth pictures of like really big processors because I think it's easier to learn with just a handful of qubits, like two to five qubits when you're looking at it for the very first time. But we've been able to build processors that are over 400 qubits large at this point, just using these exact same techniques. And you can see here, you know, compared to the size of your hand, how, how small it really is. And that holds over 400 qubits.
And we have a plan, this is the IBM Quantum Development Roadmap um, going forward, to build even larger processors using these transmon qubits, using these same development techniques that we have been using all along. So here you can see last year we debuted the Osprey processor. That's what I was showing you um, on this slide. This is called Osprey. This has 433 qubits. And then at the end of this year, we're going to introduce another qubit processor called the Condor, which is going to have, for the first time ever, over 1,000 qubits. Um, and Heron, which will be a series of 133 qubits, which are coupled to other processors of 133 qubits as well. So it's really an exciting time to be working in superconducting qubits and be in the field. Because when I first joined and I saw this development roadmap for the first time, you know, I was very intimidated. It's a lot, especially when you're in graduate school and you're only working with one or two qubits at the at the time, like I was. Um, scaling up to, you know, even 20 qubits seems really daunting. And the idea of scaling up to 1,000 at the time a few years ago um, seemed really, really hard too. But every single year we've been on track and we've been able to complete everything that we've laid forward. And we have a plan, um, you know, to scale up to, to thousands of qubits in the near future. And so if we put it all together, you can see that we've talked about many different components today. We've talked about the cables, we've talked about the amplifiers, we've talked about the qubits, um, we, we've talked about all these room temperature control electronics as well. So I think, you know, one misconception that I just want to talk about here is that when people are interested in studying quantum, I think they're only interested in the processor itself, in fabricating, making, controlling qubits. And that's awesome. That's like definitely a really, really interesting part of it. But that's not actually what I did in my degree and you know I measured amplifiers and I built amplifiers cryogenic amplifiers for qubits for qubit readout for my PhD and there's plenty of people who work on all sorts of different parts of the fridge and the control electronics for their degrees or you know at their job as well because all of these need to be working so precisely in order to create the technologies that we're hoping to, to create in the next few years. So there's a lot of work to be done, but not all of it is just on the processor itself, right? Um, so you have people working on you know, creating better cables, you have people who are working on better control electronics. If you have any sorts of skills that are useful in the laboratory, you can work on any sorts of different layers of the quantum computing hardware stack. Um, and then, you know, for the last few minutes here, I just wanted to talk about some of the challenges that we still have to face going forward. Like I said, we need to supply control signals, and long term we need to find electronics. Um, so we'll be looking at cryo CMOS lines, and this signal must be routed into a fridge, and current coax lines probably won't scale beyond like a thousand coaxes in a standard fridge, so we need something that's a little bit more flexible and a little bit higher density. And in parallel, we're also looking at how do we scale up to millions of qubits. Is this all going to fit in one fringe? Probably not. We'll probably need multiple fridges. So how do we get processors that are in different fridges to talk to one another? It's a really, really interesting problem. Um, so these are all sorts of different things that we're looking at. And at the same time, we're trying to build you know, better gates on the hardware. We're trying to make our coherence times better. We're interested in making the junctions more precise when we fabricate them as well. There's a lot of work to be done, um, but it's all very, very exciting. And just really quickly here at the end, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the errors, the types of errors that can occur, because I know Zlatko is going to dive into noise and errors in his lecture. So just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's coming, we sometimes talk about errors in terms of coherent and incoherent errors. And coherent errors are like slow noise errors that cause operations to a qubit that you didn't intend. And you can model this operation as a gate here. So say if I wanted to basically make two qubits um, you know, go through a C0 gate, this is what the uh, unitary gate would look like. If it was perfect, it would have two ones on the diagonals and then on the off diagonal here in the lower quadrant. But what that would actually translate to in reality is something that's not you know, 100% precise. It might look like this experimental um, matrix here on, on the right. And so you can see here that it's close to one, but it's not exactly one. There's some amount of error, there's some little epsilon of error that was introduced. And so what this actually does, if you look at the block sphere diagram here again, is if you apply this operation and you rotate around the block sphere, it creates that little that little epsilon of error. 
which is maybe not so bad, but then if you were to apply it again, then you would have two epsilon, and again, then you have three epsilon, and so the error can compound and become a pretty big problem over time. Um, and this is caused by a not full, complete model of all of the interactions and all of the leakage of information that's happening. And then on the other side, we have incoherent errors, which are sort of fast noise errors, and they're, they're random. Um, so one of them is qubit decoherence, which is the loss of quantum information in the qubit that happens when the qubit falls or decoheres from the excited state into the ground state. Um, and then there's also dephasing time, which is the randomization of the phase. So instead of like the vertical uh, error that would occur on the block sphere, you would have more of a horizontal error around the equator, that's phi, and then T2, which would be the overall decoherence time, which you can see here as a combination of both the T1 error and the T5 error. And you can model that here, um, as you can see, it, just an example, and get an average statistic of what that T1, that decoherence error would be for every single qubit. And like I said, this is a problem that we are confronting and we're continuing to try to improve upon every single day in the lab. Um, and you can see that we have made very significant progress with our coherence times. This is a model of T2 times uh, over time as the years go by. And it's a little bit outdated. This one only goes up to 2019, I think. But you can see here that it's following, you know, a really good path upwards. And the T2 times are becoming much larger. And we expect this trend to continue. And we know that soon we're going to have coherence times where that's not going to be our biggest problem. That's not going to be the dominant source of error on our processors. And then we can move on to the next dominant source of error and continue to improve our technologies. Um, and very last thing I wanted to say is there are also sources of leakage in our quantum processors. Leakage is when the qubit is excited or it's driven out of what we call the qubit manifold. So it's when the qubit leaves the typical ground and excited state or the uh, G in the E state and goes to the F state or the H state or an even higher state. And that's bad because you know, then it's no longer <laughs> necessarily a qubit anymore. And we don't have good ways of correcting those types of errors. And when you're applying error correcting code, you really do need it to be within the qubit manifold. And there are lots of things that can cause this error, um, such as the bandwidth of fast pulses can excite those transitions that from single qubit gates. There's also readout error, readout signal when you're actually measuring the, the, the qubit that can excite multi-photon transitions to states well above F even. And you can sort of see that here, I know it's a little bit small, but you can see those Gaussian distributions sort of grow and you can see more and more pop up. So whether we would only theoretically like to have one for G and one for E, it really <laughs> can quickly spiral out of control and be F and G and H and all sorts of different um, excited states as well. So this is something to be mindful of. Two qubit gates can do this. Um, CR can, the cross resonance gate can require some very strong drive tones, which basically introduce so much energy that the qubit gets excited away. And we also know we need to avoid certain frequency collisions, which means interactions with harmonics from other qubits, other nearby qubits as well, to avoid leakage. So this is just an area of ongoing research, which I want you to be aware of because it's one of the most important areas that we're looking into in the near future. All right, so that concludes uh, today's lecture. So just really quickly, some summaries and takeaways that I want to make sure I emphasize before we, we break. Now you know what a real superconducting qubit looks like and the components that make it up and how important the Joseph's injunction is. Um, you also know a little something about classical circuits as well as these quantum circuits. You know, uh, yes, like I said, what Joseph's injunctions are, how to measure and control a qubit, and specific key challenges in the field of hardware research and engineering as well. Um, so thank you for your attention, and I'm going to be happy to answer questions later on for you this afternoon. Thank you.